as I said, I went to Bala Bala um, and Depot Oreo, and I was there for 20 months, trained 500 to recruits every three months. Um, and we had our fun and whatever. I think I covered that part of it. Then I went to the SFA. Well, I, I was under the impression I was going to, to HQ4 Brigade at Fort Vic. When I got there, Nicholas Forsett pointed across the runway and said, go to the old scouts uh, fort. You meet a guy called Annie Young, and they will tell you what's going on. And I went and I was attached to the SFA. Uh, Chris, uh, before yeah. you go into the SFA, yeah. you, you did a, a number of um, fire force operations from uh, Grand Reef, didn't you? Yes. Is oh, yeah. there, okay. Yes. Is there one in particular, one incident yes. that really sticks out in your mind? Yes. We were deployed into the Mata uh, Mutasa TTL. Um, early morning, flew if flying in there. Um, that's that's when I got injured on the neck. I don't know if I covered that one. No, um, okay. Well, anyway, um, we were dropped in the. I remember, I was the I was the fourth stick in because I was track and platoon. But there was already a punch up going on in there in, uh, at the base of this hill that the scouts had seen uh, the the tours had gone into this place. <clears throat> As I was going up a path, we heard some sounds just behind a big rock. So that's when I took out a white phosphorus grenade and I threw it over and you know, the normal story, and then the next minute around, a flash off the side of one of the rocks and a piece of the, the casing hit me in the throat here um, and it bled profusely, but it wasn't pumping. So my guy, my guy with me said, no, he said, it's all right, you can carry one. So I carried on. We went up on top there and we now had a, a sort of auditorium view of the contact taking place. This is where they were in, in front of us on the ground. We heard the K-car engage a tree, and there was a, a, a guy dodging around a tree, and the K-car whacked him, but he was huge, this guy, okay, which we later we went down there, and this guy was a colored guy. He must have been six foot four, six foot five, um, and really big, and his overalls only came up halfway up his up his shins, and his, on his sleeve halfway up his head, wow. and a big lot of bush of hair, but the K-car got him, and then then... In front of us, there was this big rock with a crack in the middle of it, and there was this corporal from Orlai, really brave. Um, he, he was on top there, and he was looking down there, and he would see it too, and he would shoot. And then after he'd done it about two or three times, suddenly he started to have hard extractions on his rifle, and he had to kick the round out, which he duly did, and then he would see another one, and he'd shoot. He shot about seven toes in this thing down there in the bottom. Meanwhile, Next minute, the other side of this hill, um, we heard a whole lot of fire taking place. And uh, and they said, he's down. And okay. And they said, but he's still firing at us. <clears throat> so they fired some more. Anyway, we had to find out later that my white phosphorus had landed on his uniform, this guy. He'd taken off, run right through the whole contact area to the other side. And they, they he'd run into a stick and they'd shot him. But he, the white phosphorus is on his on his webbing and things like that, and the rounds were exploding on his chest webbing, and that is where they said he's still shooting at us. Oh, wow. So they they literally shot him to pieces, you know, until until he stopped shooting. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I don't even remember how many guys were shot in that thing. It was, it was one of these huge hills um, that um, had these rock caverns and everything around the bottom of it. Um, and then, of course, last light, everywhere the, the ground tail came in in the truck, and they put the bodies in the ground tail and took it away, took it away, uh, took them away, and then we flew back as the five, four, six, the four, six flew back out of the out of the place, uh, back to Grand Reef. Can um, can you give uh, an idea of what sort of commands the K car commander gave to sticks? You know, move, okay, move, yeah. move okay. west, go right. How did they yeah. communicate? Sometimes. Okay, um, when he put you on, when they put you on the ground, you'd hear them, uh, the commander, because you, as a headset stick commander, you'd have a headset on. Um, you know, in, in the in the <clears throat> early days, we used to sit behind the pilot, the stick commander. That changed. We used to sit in the middle between, and they brought the gunner and put him at the back there, facing out. Okay, so he could engage if he with his gun. Yeah. necessary because he didn't flick out any rounds just threw the grounds out the bottom um and um then he would say okay i'm putting you down by the uh, by the open midi field over there or by that village or that crawl or whatever once you're in position 
he would say, if he didn't know where you were, he'd say, okay, take out your map or turn over your helmet, your hat. And in your hat, you had a day glow panel and sometimes. And sometimes if he didn't do it, take out, a, a, I had a, a piece of stainless steel mirror and you put it up and you flick it to him and he would say, I have your visual. Okay, what I want you to do now, <laughs> there was a common saying of all the, the, the KCO commanders is, okay, stick one. What I want you to do now, I see you in line there, turn slightly right, move forward 300 meters. You turn slightly right, move forward 300 meters into position. Right, stop there, wait there, right. Stop two. This is KCO. You read me? Right, Roger, I read you. Right. I see where you are now. Now get into your further, widen your extended line and move towards that big, thick bush in front of you 50 meters. And that is how the commands used to. When you hit, when you have a visual, then you say, KCO, I have a visual. Uh, we, we're being fired on, whatever you give you straight away, the normal contact, contact stuff. Um, and that that, uh, that was how they, and then a lot of times the KCO will say, everybody stand still, KCO is firing. Or you say, Cyclone, uh, uh, Cyclone 4 is coming in. It's going to do a strike on the thick bush in front of you guys. And then he would come and either do a snib rocket um, or he would do a front end, throw a front end on the, the enemy position. That, um, that, that must have taken an unbelievable amount of situational aware, awareness from the KCAR commander. KCAR, come on. Just unreal. Four sticks was nothing for some of the guys. Some yeah. of them had 12 to 16 sticks on the ground. And yeah. to stay coherent with exactly where each stick was and so forth was awesome. There mm. were many guys I saw who I just I just couldn't believe that they could do that and how they, they were able to remember exactly where. Although, you know, they had on the on the in their jumpsuits, they had a little pocket like the pilots had yeah. and there was a map and they would mark out with the with the old um Chinagraph pen, which we weren't all technically orientated like now. You know, you take out your cell phone and say, yeah. stick one. <laughs> Here's where I want you to move. <laughs> and, and then do, and then he, do any the names of any of those commanders stick out in your mind? Um, Denison, who was one or uh, two RL, A Company, yeah. um, Paula Henry, uh, Johnny Dawson, um, Armstrong, um, Pat Armstrong was that first contact when I did the HDF, he was in the ch gunship above. There was a blonde headed guy who was one of the commandos in Orlai as well. When I was at, at Grand Reef, he, he was also in, in um, the, in the K car a couple of times. Um, I can't remember his name. Um, it takes a tremendous amount of skill, and I reckon they saved a lot of <laughs> men's lives and got a lot of the enemy through their um, shrewdness. Well, it, it certainly was a, a, um, a technique. The Fire Force, or, or as the Yanks originally called it, vertical development plans. But Fire mm. Force, as we called it, uh, because we then we then started to add the paradeck to it. Mm. Um, and then we have four sticks jump out of the paradeck as well, added to it. And you had a ground tail. The first time when the Fire Force first started, it started off with just four choppers uh, and uh, three uh, G cars and one K car, and off they trundled into the air. Then it got a little bit more complex, and you'd start to have cyclones coming, a uh, cyclone four involving the the um, uh, push pull coming in, um, and and giving ground uh, attack, uh, ground air uh, air ground attack, um, and you would have the um, uh, the deck would come in. Uh, in fact, oh yes, one once I was, at, I'm just trying to think of where it was. Uh, we called in uh, the. The K car called in a strike, and we had um, uh, Canberra do a strike. Now he, what he did was he threw out flechette. Now I'd never, uh, you know, sort of what was this? And and as we watched it drop out of the the aircraft, this bomb opened up, and out of it came these six to eight inch looking pieces of steel. Okay, had a fin on it. I saw them later, and it looked like a six inch nail with a plastic fin on it. And they they were they went right through trees, mm. straight, through it, and it was like a whooshing sound. As they were released into the area, um, I also had an incident, um, um, two incidents where um, the Canberra dropped out the bouncing bombs um, and in, in, into an area that was also north of um, um, Grand Reef in the hills. There, I'm just trying to think of where it was. Uh, <clears throat> we didn't see any tours. It was one of those kind of situations. We never saw any tours. Um, we were in our stick group positions and. Other people sorted it out, and we weren't told to move. We were just out of the area. The people on the ground were told to handle it, and so forth. Um, uh, if you, I must admit, if the you bouncing saw, bomb was really frightening. I bet. If you yeah. saw TERS before the KCAR 
or one of the other jeep cars saw them, how would you pinpoint where they were? Would you fire a, a pencil flare or throw smoke? We had different techniques, okay? Um, first of all, you're going to go back to zero or, and, and you'd hear, hear from the K-car. My call sign normally has a track of two and it's 5-3. 5-3, this is K-car. You say, K-car, this is 5-3. We are three minutes out from your position. Roger, okay. And then if we had a way of showing, where, if, if they knew where we were straight away, there was a one technique of uh, I give you one uh, uh, a five second Becker homing device. You press down your press switch and you held it down, and they would lock on onto it. On um, <clears throat> then when they came, you, normally we'd say to them, "The wind is blowing in such and such a direction." And if the wind was blowing in that direction, then they would go downwind with a chopper and fly in. And they normally fly over you towards the enemy position. And then as they flew over you, you would say to them, "Okay, you are over the enemy position now." And then you'd go into a bank, you'd bank, the, the, the gunship would bank left and lift straight high into the air. Um, and the G cars would then go in a wider sweep further out. Um, then if you wasn't, still wasn't sure, if there wasn't any movement in there, then we had ways where we would fire the, the mag into the position to show it. Okay. They had, I never used it, but the guys would, apparently guys were given this rocket launcher type thing, which had the SNEB rocket in it. You know, the, from the aircraft slip, and it had a white phosphorus section on it, and you oh. fired this thing at the target. I saw it, but I never fired it. I never had the opportunity. Uh, I did what I did do <coughs> was I did use pencil flare to fi fire in the direction of where they were, um, and on occasion I fired um, a, a thousand foot flare in the direction of where it was, um, paraluminating in the base. They were able to see it in the daytime. Um, those are the ways that we would say. And, and then um, if, if uh, he, he did, still didn't see the site, then we would say to him, from where my um, uh, uh, flare landed, add 300 away from our position, and then they would sweep out further. And then sometimes they used to put prophylactic fire into the position of fire 102 rounds. And then, of course, uh, yeah, not many brave people would stay in that position. They would start running. Uh, prophylactic is when they use condoms, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> well, then, then they, uh, yeah, I was going to say how fast they ran. <laughs> um, yeah. I, was, I cut you off when you were talking about the bouncing bombs. I mean, uh, when a Canberra runs in, it's very silent, isn't it? And uh, very quiet. All the stuff comes up uh, below and makes a hell of a mess. It's, it's like a rumbling uh, orrr, as they explode. They don't all explode at the same time. And that bush area where you see it, it just, it leaves and everything and dust just flies into the air and it you know we were about uh, about just over under a kilo away from the position and we just saw this whole area just uh, and way heat waves and pieces of tree and everything just flying all over and sparks of it it was an incredible thing but we, you know I, I never had the chance of seeing the guys using a got the the uh, that's the alpha bomb the golf bomb mm. uh, on on uh, on, on from a hunter because they, they were you know two I think they were two fifty kg bombs with a proboscis on the front. I heard about them. I saw them. I never saw. I never was involved in where they did throw them. But I oh. heard that in some areas they had that uh, that they found guys leaning against the tree, to totally dead, but yeah. he's still in a standing position. Yeah, because of the, the explosion between the two bombs. Oh. But, but one bomb had a, had had, a, had flaps that made it drop short of the other one Three and times, then they would yeah. detonate about 500 meters apart and there would be a shockwave in between it would kill anything i saw one of those uh, 250 pounders or 250 kgs dropped at katanga when they yep. were practicing and we were standing about two or three k's away there was like a a, a bunker there there was um one of these ladies uh w whatever you call them standing up there yeah and when the shockwave hit us, we turned around to look at her and she'd fallen off the roof of this thing and uh, was lying on the ground with her skirt up in the air. No disrespect to ladies, but I think she got it. The, the upside of that is that we had a, a lovely kudu to eat uh, <laughs> <laughs> when we went over to look at the bomb crater. I think we'll move on to your um, Firma Rivani um, right. e experiences. Uh <laughs> Yeah, um, if anybody knows uh, the, who knows the airfield at uh, Fort Vic, um, on the other side uh, of, of the, of, let's say on the northeastern side of it was HQ4 Brigade. And 
quite close to where the chapel, the Italian chapel is. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced or, but mm. there was an Italian, there's an Italian prisoners of war built a chapel there. Oh, yeah. yeah. In, in that area, right. Yeah. And we were quite close to that chapel. Okay. Um, and I, I crossed over and went across there. And um, uh, at first I was given a motorcycle to, because I now was moving into Masringo Barracks, Choreo Barracks. I was given a house there. I was married. I, had, um, I had, didn't have a child yet, but it was soon coming. And um, I then went into uh, went across there and I was introduced to the guy, the SP guys who were there. And um, the one guy, Andy Young, which I believe lives in, I don't know, um, Uzbekistan or something like that at the moment, okay, from what I've, I've heard, or one of those type of places, East European countries. So I moved, I moved across to uh, the Fumarawana base, um, where, which was run by uh, a Special Forces Brigade, um, but I was, a I was from uh, HQ4 Brigade. Um, and then... Um, we had a training area near Zimbabwe Ruins Hotel. Um, so the guys were being trained there. And at the same time, I had detachments out. Uh, well, we had detachments at that stage at Chikwanda, Zimutu, Bilingui, Chibi, Zaka, Bakita, Gutu, oh, uh, Morganster. Um, the, previous to that, there was a detachment in the Nigena, okay, which proved to be uh, a dysfunctional detachment, and it was brought back to um, um, Fort Vic, where it went through a cleaning process. And um, I wasn't there at that time. I arrived after that incident, and there was an incident there where there was an AD and a policeman was shot in the leg, and he passed away from his femoral artery being shot. <coughs> what Chris, they did? Mm. Sorry, we are yeah. kind of taking the the dog by the tail here. For the sake of our international views, could you explain what who the Fuma Rivanu were and what the the, okay. the aims were with them? When when we started this, uh, the the government started this uh, amalgamation where they were going to give election. They had elections for um, uh, black people to uh, vote and so forth in Rhodesia, um, which then became Zimbabwe Rhodesia. And at that stage, Bishop Abel Muzarewa became the president as far as I remember. And um, what happened was that uh, he then set out the call and uh, he brought back his fighters out of Zanna. All right. I don't know how many he really had in reality because there were some nasty incidents in other places and Orelai had to do some cleansing, sorting out of certain detachments that just didn't cooperate or didn't come right. Yeah. But it was fully with the command of Mzarewa and so forth. Um, now, um, this, this, this is very much under McEwen's um, um, theories of counter-revolutionary operations, um, where you start with what you call the oil spot syndrome, where you put it at a group of, of counter-revolutionaries into an area, and then they start to counter-mobilize the people in that area. Now, this is why we had these people in these different TTLs at business centers. And at, the, at those business centers, then you would have in your detachment of about 140 guys, which is about a company string, normal company string. You'd have, obviously have a commander. <clears throat> you'd have a political commissar. Um, you would have a medic and you'd have an educator. Now, the job of the commissar was to do counter mobilization in the area. The medic would then watch the clinics. So the clinics were not giving medical aid to the revolutionaries, the, the guerrilla forces. And the, the um, educator would be in the school checking that the teacher were not mobilizing the children. So, um, and that is basically what you would have. You'd go into the center, you'd set up a, a base in that business center, and then you'd have subunits. Now, those subunits were like a platoon string, would be set at three subunits um, in strategic points, and they'd build a base camp in that area. And what they would do then was that they would patrol that whole area, so they would close it off. And, and some of those areas were only 10 kilos across, and they, those, they would patrol that whole area to pre prevent any movement day and night of any guerrilla forces coming into the area, or the tours coming into the area. Um, and that, then what they were doing with the mobilization was then they would start recruiting the youth in the area, and those that proved themselves would then be sent back for training and become part of the detachment. And then, then 
um, what you would have then would you would have this um, uh, a bubble stretch out and certain of the more experienced guys would go into it and some of the new guys would go into that that, that subunit and the other subunits were strengthened again and build up the whole the whole force into that area. Um, and as I said, there were some areas there that had two or three uh, units in, in um, detachments in that in in each area. Um, and we had some very good good guys like um, a guy in Zaka. Uh, his name was Master Plaster, and uh, he had no mercy. There was a, a bit of an outcry when he um, some of his guys were involved in the rape of a young girl, and. Uh, <coughs> Uh, he carried out the immediate uh, tour type uh, justice uh, and the population at first was horrified and then realized what had happened um, and the guy the two guys were executed uh, the cops wanted to arrest the, arrest the detachment commander uh, the cops were given a very strict instructions not to do that um, then we had a guy James John who was at Bakita he was very good as well um, and, and there were a couple of other guys. Chikwanda detention, um, Stephen Mutasa. Um, uh, he was very good. And uh, in fact, at one stage, the scouts tried to infiltrate into his area. And he sent a message with the messenger, don't come in my place. And he told them, otherwise I'm forced to kill you. And they just left his detachment area quite a lot. Um, besides, besides that, then we had 300 guys down at Cheredzi, who were Shangans. We called them our Shangan army. <clears throat> and we had some guys, uh, like a, a guy, O'Leary, American ex-Special Forces, whatever, raw type guy. Whatever. He was with them down there. Um, the thing that we learned about the, the Shangans is that very good trackers, very brave, but when there's a drop, there's a drop. And they were just, uh, they like drinking a lot. But they weren't afraid to get onto tracks, and they weren't afraid to get into contact. Um, so you have to give them credit for that. Um, then we built up from this two and a half thousand guys to just about five thousand five hundred guys. And I had to uh, detach to me from the South African Defence Force. Uh, they would deny it, okay? But I had these National Service officers, except for one was a permanent force officer. And funny enough, he wasn't an infantry officer. He came from the Navy. But he was a bomb disposal expert. Mm -hmm. and he came to. I haven't been able to trace him again. Um, his first name's Hans. I don't know where he is. I've looked around the world on Facebook and whatever, and his name, the same name has come up. But when I've tried to contact, nobody's come back to me to say they know him. Um, and um, these national services were sent out to detachments. Some of them were brilliant. Some of them were total. They, they couldn't handle the situation. The, the stress, you know, you've got one white boy with 150, 160, maybe 300 guys on his yeah. own. He's, he's just left school. Remember yeah. that? He's the National Serviceman. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, we, we, we had one serious big contact one day. Um, uh, I think it was the Chibi or Chilamanzi area. Um, what happened was we trained up a detachment and we sent the detachment out to deploy there. And um, there was a, a two RAR lieutenant there. A New Zealander by the name of Graham Trass. He was with him. Uh, I, I contact him every now and again. He got a silver cross, actually, Graham. But they, they, he had a little Jack Russell type dog. And in the middle of the night, the dog jumped off and took cover under the bed. And he shouted, stand to. And there was a big contact. And um, at first light, in came Fire Force Zulu, which was in Pumas and, and a, in khaki uniform. Not the, normal guys um, and um, there was no gooks around and so they left and as they were leaving the gooks came back to attack and then they came back and then there was a big punch up and they sorted out a lot of these guys um, but the, the the attack by the tours that night was quite concerted um, and uh, so that was one big attack that we had against us and then um, just before the ceasefire I went down to Morgan's submission um, we had information that there was some skullduggery going on down there. And so I was with my detachment. Uh, well, I, I went with the detachment. <coughs> and um, that was the incident where, we, um, um, as we were moving early in the morning with the mist, 
we heard the guy shouting again, Anamanya, Anamanya, they're running, they're running. And in the in the mist, I could see this guy run past, and then he ran back the other direction. So I followed him with, the, I was carrying an RPG at that time. I followed, the, tracked him from behind and went further in front of him. And um, and then we went forward and then we found the guy um, on the ground. Um, we took the documents from the, he had some documents last week. That was about, it was about two or three days before the ceasefire. Okay, so it was a bit of a nauseous little incident. Mm. We took his documents and, and uh, I got myself a watch. He had the Omega watch, which uh, was like a, um, a, a five shilling piece. It was nice, beautiful. I don't know where he's taken it, probably from an attack on a farm or something like that. And um, I, I eventually gave it away to somebody who didn't want it. And then uh, we, we, we went back with the, um, and then we had an incident there with some Zanu PF guys came there. A guy called Nyoka, as far as I remember, his name was Nyoka. And uh, he got in my face and he got in the face of my butt and my OPD as well. And he lay down <laughs> on the ground. I did, you know, it was, it was an ugly situation, it was unnecessary. He didn't have to come in. But uh, he was well known afterwards because he only had half a front tooth. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was the, the, the eventually, then we had the ceasefire and went to elections and we were told to disband the SFAs. Now, they carried a lot of G3s. There were a couple of AKs, RPDs, PKMs, 60 more mortars, RPGs and stuff like that. And we gathered in a lot of that stuff. Um, Chris, uh, and, uh, you made the comment that um, if this system had been started a couple of years earlier, it would have changed the course of the war, in your opinion. I firmly believe that if they had have put, started it around 1976 or so, um, and and formulated in the way, not the way a lot of other detachments are run, but the, in other and other provinces. But the way Nick Fawcett, he was getting us to do it in the area, the green belt system, as we called it. Um, if we had done it his way, um, he was quite an astute guy. Um, and um, if we had done it his way, um, uh, in let's say 1975, 76, the course of the war would have been totally different. The the guys would have been. Um, uh, Counter mobilization would have taken place out in the details and were the done and dusted. As, as now, what's happening with the elections and things like that, the rural population backs Zanu PF, where the urban population is on the new parties that are out uh, and so forth, the conciliation party and so forth. Um, and, and, and they would have changed that, uh, that rural population's thinking in, in quite, quite, uh, uh, in a, quite a, a radical manner. Um, because when you went to the elections, you could see the guys we, because they'd believed, they'd been told that you must look up in the sky because they said, and you must open your paper so that the satellite can see that you are voting for us. That type of tactic. You saw them open the paper and, and you know, and then fold it and put it in so that he was safe. Because you had guys going, crowing like a rooster in the background and then going with a knife and looking at the people. And you know, the Jongwe was the symbol of the of yeah. Zanu PF at that stage, yeah. And they were yeah. all told to vote on day one. If they voted on day two, Absolutely. three, they were told, yeah. The lines were incredible. And after that, it was nothing. But then now you see with the, with the way that people should do it now is they should go to all the rallies and all the rest of it. But then, and eat the food and have the party. And when it comes to voting day, sign for the other side. That's the way it should work. You know, yeah. it's because it, it, the, the abuse that takes place and the atrocities that are taking place right now mm. are very similar to what happened before. Yeah. You know, now they're trying to blame Mugabe for no Zessa not having electricity. Mm. But it's, same as that sort of situation. Yeah. So, but it was sad to watch all those guys. Oh, I was mm. talking about the guy in the Chukwanda detachment, Stephen Mutasa. He came across uh, down to the south and actually he ended up going to Sierra Leone. He went with the executive outcomes eventually with him. And then I met him again in uh, Petersburg. And then I didn't meet him because he was going to come and meet me for a cup of tea a couple of days later. And I heard that he had gone into hospital, he'd got malaria and he had died, passed away. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So he had quite a record as well. He Check was he was the guy who told the scout to keep out of his area. Yeah. So good. I think if we could spend the next 10 or 15 minutes uh, just briefly covering what happened when the war ended, you left the country joined the SADF yeah. and what happened there and the rank that you finally attained? Yeah, um, I left there as a captain and I uh, went down to the South African Army. The South African Army took me in um, and uh, I, I was going to go to the Kukrumpas in the Hallmark building 
to be evaluated to go to five recce. I got married. I had one kid. I said, yeah, man, I'm not going to sit in the bush for nine months a year of the year and so forth. So I then went to one to one battalion, which was at Josini, which was about a platoon strength at that stage. <clears throat> um, it had, uh, it didn't really have a commander. It had a captain there. Um, and, um, when I arrived there, then I was told to now recruit the next year. So I said, okay, where's the manuals? Give me all the, ma uh, there's no manuals for them. So I said, what about, uh, for firearms, for, um, a, um, for field craft, all those different, uh, um, map reading and all the rest of it. Where are the manuals? I didn't know. So what did I do? I went back to my trunk box and out came depot or our training manual. And all my lesson plans were there, and that's how we did it. Unfortunately, the, the, I, I was a shock to the system of the National Service guys, lieutenants and corporals that came there, because I didn't teach it the way that they thought it would be done. Um, and uh, then next year, five recce's base that was at Balabala near Matubatuba had been compromised by some guy, and I think his name was Evans or something. And so they went off to Balaboa. We took over the base. And in that year, we did a parade, uh, the opening of the base, in, in the training, opening of the base, uh, a independence parade in Maritzburg, independence parade in Durban, where we were the lead of, of the black units. We were in front because our guys were smartest. Um, and then at the end of that year, we went and did three months up in um, near Chandelier Gate in, uh, um, in the Rundu area, Sector 2-0. Um, and... I was in there in, I did quite a few diff different trips. I did quite a few different um, uh, courses. I had to go back and do my mortar course again. And um, then uh, went to Ruakana, uh, did another trip at Ruakana, which was a very interesting trip, um, which made some, the commandant in charge of Ruakana base have gray hairs because my guys went across the border and did all sorts of things. Some of them were ex roadies I can tell you about that sometime. And then, um, and then I decided I wanted to go to a, I'd done junior staff course and all the rest. I decided I wanted to go smell a bit of gun smoke again. So I asked to be posted and they posted me to 101 Battalion. That proved to be a bit of a, for me, uh, uh, an anticlimax. It didn't really work out the way I wanted it to work out. Um, and I was given to a conventional company, not with the Romeo Mike companies. And, um, but we had our fun. We did, uh, a couple of weeks uh, external as well, and in uh, in a matter of about seven days, we recovered about just under thirty uh, caches, arms cache. One, our biggest arms cache was over a hundred B10 bombs. Oh. It filled the whole back of a of a biffle mm. that we recovered. And the only way we found it is because one of my my biffles nearly drove into it, yeah. into the hole. And then then from there, um, uh, I was posted out of 101 Battalion to. Um, Take over 907 SDR car special services company in uh, uh, Messina. Uh, and while I was waiting to be introduced to Sotban Spanish military areas commander, I was introduced to the commander of uh, 116 battalion, of which 907 was a subunit. He invited me to be his 2RC because his 2RC had been fired for some nefarious activities with one of his captain's wives. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I, I said to him, quite fine, I'll go there, but you teach me. His name was Peter Rose. His nickname was Declaim Cuban. Dark head owned. The beauty, I used to tell him in a pub, you know, it's, it's a fantastic unit, which is the most fantastic unit. It's the only unit that I've ever had a commanding officer shorter than me. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a very clever man, and um, uh, he trained me up, and, and I became 2RC of uh, 116. And what rank was that, uh, Chris? Uh, when I was two, I see. Uh, when, when I went to uh, 101 battalion, I went as a major. When I left 101, I was as a major, and it, it, I was two, I see, of 116 battalion for three years as a major. Um, uh, Rose was posted out in 116 battalion. We had normal training of um, troops, black troops, um, only of them northern Sutus, Pedi people, um, and some Shangan, some Chuanas, some Vendas, and um, and we had a little group of ex roadie guys. That's, they were in 907. 907 went through a period from Biffles to Mingues to Caspers. Um, and we had a, a, a 
a Berrieda platoon, a mounted infantry platoon and a bike squad. Um, and then um, Diderot was posted out. Uh, I was in, a new guy came in uh, as the boss man um, and I was posted out at, uh, about, when was it, 89, 99, oh, 89, I'm trying to think now, for 93, yeah, on about 89 I was posted out um, to Far North Command where I went into the ops room. I was there for about three or four months and I was sent to headquarters unit of the 2RC. And a short period after that, then um, I was told to pack the OC's stuff of headquarters unit by the general and uh, Furi. And I was, uh, I was took over as, as a as officer commanding of uh, headquarters unit at Far North Command. <coughs> um, the year after that, then I became a commandant, a lieutenant colonel. Um, and I was there, and then, of course, elections, all the nausea and the rest of it. Um, but there are many exciting stories in, in amongst all of that. And uh, I decided that I was going to retire. And in March, um, around March, I retired out of the South Africa Defence Force. And I started planning, and I went to Zambia and farmed. Um, and I was there for a couple of years and so forth and came back. But anyway, that's besides the story. There were there were many interesting ex uh, incidents that took place, like at Far North Command, like the general who was Manal Fari, who was a big man, six foot seven, and he said to me, Chris Garland, go out there where they had, we had a whole lot of those, um, what are you, those with those purple flowers um, that we have, jacarandas, oh, yeah. and in a park, car park. And he said, Mark Swin, so I, Went in there and I took in a, a, a unimog in there and I cut the trees that height. I don't think he really meant me to do it that way. The next day he walked in there at the conference and he then proclaimed the area as Chris Garland, Sedalville Wood. <laughs> 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 but it was amusing. <clears throat> I had some amusing instances where, where he was the general gave instructions that we, you know, every person had to show his ID coming to the gate. He, about a week later, he comes to the gate and a, a lance corporal at the gate says, um, your ID? He says, be kidding me. You know who I am? He says, yes, I know, but Major Garland, uh, at that stage, I was a major. Major Garland says, you must have your ID. So he turns in, the lieutenant came around the corner and he said to him, lieutenant, come here. Oh, yeah, I'm your lieutenant man. He says, ha oh, but you don't know. Major Garland says, you must have your ID. <laughs> so he's going to reverse, shot home, came back. Instead of like normal, he used to go and park behind the headquarters because we were at the a, 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 a college, this old school college there in Petersburg. He said he parked next and he came storming down the front veranda and passed us in. Chris Garland, senior in my country. Dashed off there and one of the intelligence colonel there says, no, see me, cuck. And anyway, I went in there and he said, what's this about ideas and everything? And he says, yeah, what do you, they all know who I am. I said, yeah, but General, those are your instructions. Nobody comes up <laughs> with that. Ah, oh, man, they still cuck. Oh, let's go drink tea. <laughs> there were many incidences like that as well. And and I, he used to play a lot of bridge, and I played bridge as well because my grandmother was very good at it. And uh, the, unfortunately, I didn't like playing bridge. I didn't want to sit there until 7, 8 o'clock at night playing bridge. So I used to set him up, and I wasn't invited anymore to go and play. <laughs> yeah, um, Chris, we're going to have to leave it there. Yes. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, introduce you to Kurs. I forget his surname. He does the legacy conversations uh, for the South African troops, and he's very interested in interviewing uh, Rhodesians that fought in the SADF. So I will be introducing you to him. I've appointed other guys to him in the past for interviews, and you can talk at length about your South African experiences. And um, maybe we can put a link to that at a later date for uh, us Rady guys and the international audience to come and have a look. So. I'd just like to thank you once again for a very, very interesting talk, really enlightening. And, and uh, thank you very much. I'd like to wish you all the best for the future and, and have a happy Christmas. The world is that small. We'll meet again. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Yeah, I think I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> oh, yeah. thank, thanks anytime, very much. Anytime we can chat again, you know, anything. Yeah. Just yeah. breeze on on Shona customs and African customs and things yeah. like that, which a lot of people didn't take an interest in. Um, oh, yeah. that uh, I think Hannes Vessels would love to talk to you on that. Um, yeah. And write a book. Write a book. 
Definitely. Well, I'm sitting, but you know, to get your motivation and to uh, remember, like I had to go back and try and remember dates and things. I don't think dates are really that important. They're not that important. But, yeah. Just talk into yeah. Dick Tavane and get someone else to write it out. Anyway, yeah. um, cheers and thanks very much, Chris, for coming. Thank on. you very much for giving me the opportunity and and revitalizing my brain and to remembering a lot of things. I really appreciate the opportunity. It's a you pleasure, have, brother. Thank you very have much. Have a fantastic Christmas and a prosperous New Year. Thank you, and same to you. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Bye.